In 2016, not long after the premiere of the film Siege of Jadaville, director Richie Smith was asked, is, is there any dissent as to what happened? Or would, would anyone watch this film and say, that's not how it was? If there is, they'd be very quiet about it. Yeah. He later elaborated. And were there, were there significant omissions or alterations to the historical record that you had to make for the good of the drama? No, I mean, all the, all the geopolitical stuff is very accurate and very, very heavily researched. I'd say where the license is, um, like the, the bullets at the end was just an idea I came up with. I was like, what else can we do here? You know? <laughs> I'd say a solid two thirds or more of the people who know anything about the battle got their knowledge from the eponymous 2016 film. Those that haven't seen the film probably heard about it from YouTube videos that cover the battle in rather sparse detail, often using imagery directly taken from the film. For example, in one video, a former Green Beret goes through the film and sings the praises of the head of A Company, 35th Infantry Battalion, Patrick Quinlan, citing numerous events in the film that showed just how good a leader he was. The only problem with this is that the film itself is almost entirely wrong in every detail, to the point where veterans, while appreciating that their story is being told on the big screen, have stated that it in no way represents their experiences. The following is a dissection of the film, almost scene by scene. I'll be focusing on the major inaccuracies, and in some cases, outright lies, that are told throughout the 100 some minutes of the film. I'll not be paying close attention to things like weapon details or vehicles unless it's something obviously incorrect. A lot of the equipment used in the Congo at this time period is rare and difficult to get a hold of, and imagine would have been outside the budget for an early Netflix film. The other aspect of the film that's forgivable is the use of composite characters. For example, the Irish general is a composite of a real general and a lieutenant colonel. An A Company's company sergeant, Jack Prendergast, who despite sharing a name with the actual company sergeant, is actually a composite of pretty much every platoon leader in A Company. With that out of the way, every major problem with the Siege of Jadaville. The very first scene of the film absolutely butchers the story of Lumumba's capture. In reality, there was no ambush. Lumumba was captured by the Congolese army after the UN refused to protect him. After rounds of political manoeuvring, he was handed over to the Katangese, essentially to be executed on behalf of the Congolese government. The execution of Lumumba is also massively inaccurate. The film seems to want to paint everything going on in Katanga as a ploy by the mining companies. In reality, Lumumba was taken to a villa in Elizabethville, where he was beaten by members of the Katangese government, before being driven out of the city to be shot. There are no records of any representatives of foreign mining companies being present. While describing the situation in the Congo as a contest between East versus West would be true, especially in the immediate aftermath of independence, describing the Katangi secession, and especially the time period the film takes place in this way, doesn't really make any sense as it'd be more accurately generalised as a scramble between various Western factions. Though, generalising it as East versus West is most likely a filmmaking technique to raise the stakes. While General Shambi colludes with the mining companies... Throughout the film, characters refer to Moy Shambi as General Shambi, despite him never having served in the military or holding any honorary rank in the Katangese Gendarmerie. The United Nations, in deference to the Congo's wishes, has asked that once again these peacekeepers come from Ireland. Lumumba never asked specifically for Irish peacekeepers. In fact, the first contingent was made up exclusively of other African nations. But when the mission was expanded only a few days later, the UN began asking what they saw as neutral countries around the world, such as Ireland, Sweden and India. Julius Caesar in the corner there. She's read it all. He knows every battle ever fought. Does he know anything about the real thing? None of us do. Remember who's in charge. Despite the appearance that the Irish army hadn't seen much action, in the five or so years leading up to deployment in the Congo, the Irish army was actively involved in policing actions against the IRA along the border with Northern Ireland, carrying out exactly the type of missions they believed they'd be conducting in the Congo. Many NCOs had also either trained alongside men or actively taken part themselves in World War II as volunteers. Will we see any action? Who knows? I don't think anyone has a clue what's going on out there. Considering that rather famously at the time, nine Irish troops were killed and then eaten at Niemba, it's rather unbelievable to react to that question with, who knows? Jadisville. In the Katanga region. Yes, General. I understand. A Company, the unit seen in the film, was in Elizabethville, Katanga, for three months before being sent to Jadaville, making this phone call impossible. Also, having to explain it's in the Katanga region is a bizarre detail, as they already knew they were going to Katanga, 
it doesn't really help seeing as Katanga is the size of most European countries. We're the second wave of Irish soldiers to be sent into the Congo. A bizarre mistake, the 35th Infantry Battalion were actually the fifth contingent to be sent to the Congo. We welcome the forces of the United Nations here with open arms, but with some confusion. We don't know why you are here in Africa, as we are quite capable of looking after ourselves. However, we will be thoughtful hosts unless you come here to start trouble, in which case you will force us to tutor you on how things are done here in the Congo. This whole speech is completely unlike anything done by Shombi, who is once again referred to as General Shombi. While he did openly talk about being displeased with the UN's deployment to the Congo, he never openly threatened them to the press. I had a call from Khrushchev earlier. He reminded me of the UN's refusal to send in troops when Lumumba asked me to. Meanwhile, they're building a wall in Berlin. Now I want you to go put an end to General Chambers' antics. Send him a message. The UN sent forces to the Congo two weeks after independence, and less than a week after Katanga declared independence. What Hammarskjöld refused to do was use them in an offensive manner. More importantly, O'Brien arrived in Elizabethville on the 14th of June, 1961. This conversation, taking place some time after the beginning of construction of the Berlin Wall in mid-August 1961, means the timeline of this conversation is simply all over the place. But this thing, this could lead to another world war. Yes, and everybody sees that. Saying the Congo could lead to another world war is a massive exaggeration. The most generous interpretation is that it was a proxy war, but even then, it wasn't until after Katanga that the Soviets intervened militarily for a Cuban expedition in 1965. We'll make up a plan. What kind of plan? One with a lot of moving parts that requires a man astute and hard-headed enough to pull it off. It can be said that O'Brien did achieve that goal. While the film makes it appear that Operation Morpho was this plan, the month before, O'Brien authorised Operation Rum Punch, which almost decapitated the Katangese officer corps by deporting all but 50 to 100 mercenaries. Something that directly goes against the film's claim of hundreds, if not thousands, of mercenaries being involved in the very next scene. General de Gaulle, j'ai besoin d'aide. Bien, je vous enverrai un millier de nos meilleurs anciens légionnaires. Les compagnies minières les engageront comme agents de sécurité. This whole conversation is completely made up. Chambi never had any contact directly with de Gaulle, and the talk of 1,000 legionnaires being sent to Katanga is most likely a reference to Roger Trinquier, a member of the French Special Forces. A promise to hire French officers who had served in Vietnam and Algeria to serve directly for Chambi. It was given the okay to do so by the French Foreign Ministry. However, none of that actually went ahead due to various behind the scenes bickering, and in the end, Roger Falquez became the acting head of Chambi's mercenaries in Elizabethville throughout the time period the film takes place in. The shots of the Irish travelling to Jadaville illustrate one of the biggest problems with the film. A Company was made up of 156 men. The film only ever shows a few dozen at most at a time, while increasing the numbers of Katangis shown on screen to ridiculous amounts. As I mentioned before, A Company didn't immediately leave for Jadaville on arrival in the Congo. More importantly, this scene marks the point in which all historical accuracy leaves the film. With the introduction of the compound at Jadaville, the film basically makes it impossible to accurately represent what went on there during the battle. In reality, A Company had set up exactly where other UN forces had set up before withdrawing. Centered around a HQ located in the Pafina Garage on the main Elizabethville Jadaville Highway. Surrounding it was a residential area where civilians were still living within the Irish lines. Some of these civilians even rented out spare rooms to the Irish troops. Also left out is something that was a major issue for the Irish. Surrounding the houses in many places were thick patches of elephant grass and fawn bushes, meaning visibility from their positions came down to only a couple dozen meters in places. The compound shown in the film is so far off from reality there's simply no way to portray the battle accurately. This we'll see as the film goes on. Calling it a compound is a joke. We've got exposure on three approaches. Overlook from the south. There's a road, splitting it in two. We're wide open. Okay. The description of the position here also reinforces just how impossible it is to accurately represent the Siege of Jadaville. As mentioned before, O'Brien arrived in Elizabethville in June, three months prior to this scene. Jean Bay's crossed the line. We need to stop him. We're beyond the point of no return. You're therefore authorized to implement Operation Morthor immediately. I've decided we should take aggressive action. 
to reclaim key buildings held by Shambi. There's a time for talking, a time for being tough. This is the latter. The film portrays Operation Morpho as a reaction to Shambi going too far, which is a strange way to interpret why it happened. In reality, it was a follow-up to Operation Rum Punch. After Rum Punch, those that hadn't been deported had gone into hiding. Morpho was the follow-up where they intended to essentially take over Katanga now that it was leaderless, by taking over the communications of the region and arresting its government. The way the film's characters talk about Shambi and Katanga as a whole paint the picture of a warlord who has taken over a region militarily, which is a massive oversimplification bordering on outright lie. A minor nitpick, but the defences of the Irishman at Jadaville took days to finish because of the hard clay that makes up a lot of Katanga. They were also a lot more intricate, with heavy use of camouflage and bunkers, as well as roadblocks. CQMS says with food provisions enough for two days. The men have their own rations, but they're mostly biscuits you wouldn't feed to your dog. The food situation was actually a lot worse than presented in the film. When the Irish arrived at Jadaville, they found they'd accidentally left behind all of their personal emergency rations. I don't mean to be rude, but you do know that you're not welcome here, don't you? The people around here are not particularly happy with how things are working out. They didn't like Lumumba taking over. He was elected by the people. Who didn't put a lot of thought into what would happen to the mines when he took over. Nationalizing the minerals, throwing out the mining companies. What did he expect to happen? This scene is generally accurate, except for a continuing obsession with the mining companies. The civilians in Jadaville were not happy with the presence of the UN at all. This was because of their intention to reintegrate Katanga into the Congo. But the reasons for not liking Lumumba had very little to do with the mining companies, and had a lot more to do with the fact that he was seen as being anti-European in his plans to completely reshape the Congo. Even more importantly, was the fact that when the Congo gained independence, Katanga was the only region that held itself together as violence broke out throughout the country, leading to the secession. Won't you have a real drink? This scene is almost completely made up. The mercenary commander, Roger Falquez, was never in Jadaville for the duration of the Irish deployment there. He was in Elizabethville, trying to organise the Katangi's gendarmerie after Operation Rum Punch. Why are you here, Kermanen? To protect the locals from a man who stole power from the legitimately elected Prime Minister. The UN was in the Congo initially to take over from the Belgian army, after it demanded the withdrawal of its forces, who had been deployed to protect civilians from the lawlessness that began after independence. After the Belgians withdrew, it stayed in Katanga in order to maintain law and order, until Katanga could be convinced to rejoin the Congo, as Katanga had refused to allow Congolese forces into the region. Why are you here? To protect the interest of the mines. The mercenaries were there to do what mercenaries do by definition, fight in a foreign army for money. Some were adventurers, some were ideologically motivated, but many were just former soldiers who had an opportunity to use their skills to make a better living than that in the regular army, in what was generally considered a safer position, training and leading the Katangese gendarmerie. These mercs look good. Not sure why you'd have such good mercs here in the middle of nowhere. A completely baffling statement considering Jadaville was, and still is, one of the biggest cities in the Congo. The population of approximately 80 to 90,000 at the time of independence, 5% of Katanga's population. Only a few miles away at the Shinkalobwe mine was one of the Katangese gendarmerie's main camps. Things are hotting up in Africa. Civil war is raging in the new Republic of the Congo. But United Nations peacekeeping troops show they mean business. Here they are, moving in on rebel held government buildings. At the time of the film, the cities of Katanga were relatively peaceful. The footage shown is of the violence that occurred after independence that actually led to Katanga's secession. Then it transitions to events that haven't even taken place yet, as they're from Operation Morpho, with commentary that references the operation too. Would it be possible to use your phone to place a call to Ireland? A strange detail concerning the Irish position had working phones, and in reality were vital to how the battle played out. Even more strange, concerning how difficult, let alone expensive, it would be to make an international phone call from the Congo to Ireland in 1961. In fact, one of the reasons Operation Morpho targeted the Elizabethville Post Office was that it was one of the few places in the entire country that long-distance calls and telegrams could be sent from. Take the jeep to Elizabethville and tell McEntee in person there's a strong force of Americans here. Tell them to find out how many we're dealing with. 
and send reinforcements. In reality, Quinlan sent three men to impress on the leadership how difficult their position was. In addition, he himself had gone days before, but had largely been given vague words of encouragement and no solid instructions, which, to be fair on the film, is included in the next scene. Sir, reporting from A Company, Commandant Quinnan. Thank you, Sergeant. Take a seat. Yes, sir. The film takes a rather cheap shot of the Irish commander and O'Brien here, but making it look like they forced Prendergast to wait all day for him. In reality, it took all day for them to be found because they were busy planning Operation Morpho, and they were not at their HQ. Well, would you look at all of you? On the return trip from Jadaville, the three men Quinlan sent brought with them a supply truck full of food and medicine, and were escorted by a B Company of the same battalion, as well as an armoured car section. They were stopped on the bridge, and B Company and the armoured cars were turned back. Operation Morthor, sir. Something went very wrong. Sir, what happened? They had a security detail that opened fire. We returned fire and eliminated the proofs. Then they barricaded themselves inside. We couldn't afford a siege, so... So what? We finished them off with grenades through the windows and eliminated the enemy. You used grenades on unarmed civilians? We didn't know they were unarmed. What about the ones trying to climb out of the windows? We couldn't take the chance that they were armed. So you killed innocent people? Yes, sir. This didn't happen. No mention of this in UN dispatches. We didn't just murder 30 men and women in their place of work just because the troops lost the run of themselves. This is a very generous version of events. In reality, the Indians took 25 gendarmes prisoner at Radio Katanga, pushed them into a room, and threw in grenades. Then, they went through the room killing the survivors. They carried out a similar massacre at the post office in the city. O'Brien telling Raja, who for some reason is a Sikh in this version of events, to cover it up may have occurred, as the bodies were quickly buried in a mass grave behind the building, but by then, Shombi and the rest of the world had heard about it. An Irish peacekeeper even tried to make a formal complaint, but was told to keep quiet. After this, O'Brien announced to journalists that the Katangi secession was over. They've just taken Radio Katanga and the government buildings in Elizabethville. We need to retaliate. Well, since you're paying our wages. Again, Falquez was in Elizabethville as Operation Morphor began. There was no need to coax him into fighting back. His job was to organize the gendarmes and counterattack the UN forces in the city. The entire first attack is a complete fabrication. While A Company was at mass, a force of 20 to 30 gendarmes dismounted from jeeps mounted with 50 caliber machine guns that supported them as they advanced on the building. The Irish were holding mass outside, and a sergeant who wasn't at mass saw the infantry advancing, took a position at a nearby Vickers machine gun, and suppressed the infantry who withdrew under the cover of mortar fire. This shot, and others like it, have led to comparisons between the battle and the film with that shown in the film Zulu. However, there was never a case throughout the whole battle of screaming hordes of black troops charging headlong into Irish fire. And while it looks cool, there weren't any high-speed jeep crashes. Get approach from the high ground of the south. Get ten of our best south there to refuse the flank. The south flank? Are you sure, sir? Yes, now go! Yes, sir. I think the film was trying to give the impression of Quinlan being untested in combat and unsure of himself, but in reality, A Company was already set up in an all-around defence, meaning this scene is completely made up. I've been unable to find any reference to Gorman being wounded, though this is most likely a case of composite characters. However, there is also no note of anyone being injured to the face or head during the battle. Operation Morgan has taken the suspension of the Katanga government. We seized Katanga radio station and all communications at all 400 hours today. You attack the enemy without telling troops in the field! The operation has been completed successfully. This radio conversation actually occurred before the battle began in Jadaville. Uh. Not an inaccuracy, but an interesting fact. Reedy was actually shot twice, but the second shot was stopped by his magazine pouches. While most likely a budget issue, it's strange to include mounted Vickers machine guns on Land Rovers, when in the actual battle, the Irish forces at Jadaville were supported by two armoured cars, from the battalion's armoured car group, and the infantry vicars were dug in behind barricades or in trenches. 
Here we get our first good shot of Falca's right hand man, Blackjack, who is obviously supposed to be Gene Schramm, sometimes nicknamed Blackjack. The biggest problem with his portrayal here wasn't even on the continent when the battle took place, and also his shoulder patch wasn't designed until 1962. Start a radio log. From now on, everything that's said goes on record. Yes, sir. There was already standard procedure for the 35th Battalion to keep a radio log, and A Company had already been keeping one since their arrival at Jadaville. While accurate, the plan to reposition to an easier to defend position actually took place at the end of the first day. This mercenary shows up throughout the film, but this is the only decent close up in which we can clearly see he's wearing a 5 Commando patch, a unit that wouldn't come into existence until 1964 as a subunit of 5th Mechanized Division Congolese Army. Sir, uh, they never sent us the heavy 81s. While A Company was missing their 81mm mortars, it wasn't because they weren't sent them, it was because, for whatever reason, they forgot to bring them. Veterans are unsure how they lost them, because they packed them up for the move to Jadaville, but when they arrived, they no longer had them. Report your situation, Commandant. Company A, Jadaville. Be not a mortar or machine gun of fire. Expect a heavy attack any moment. With the dead they left in the field, I'd say we're looking at a force of about 1,500. A Company radio log, 11.52 hours, 13th of September. Quote, Have been fired on and returned fire. Firing still in progress. Strength of opposition, unknown. There's no mention of O'Brien ever directly communicating with Quinlan during the fighting at Jadaville. Though, after the first attack, he did hold a meeting with Lieutenant Colonel McNamee, one of the men who make up the Irish General character in the film, and General Roger, in which he explained that what was going on in Jadaville barely warranted a report to his higher-ups. All our troops in the field are on Operation Morthor, Commandant. We don't have any reinforcements. Exactly. At midday after the first attack, 35th Infantry put together Force Kane. They withdrew units that had been in combat for hours, and gathered up whatever transport they could find in order to make it to Jadaville. Their intention was to reinforce and then evacuate A Company. They left Elizabethville at 4.15pm, expecting to reach Jadaville by the next day, the 14th. Shombi wasn't really in a position to give interviews while Operation Morpho was ongoing, considering the UN was actively hunting for him. When he did finally give a press conference after Morpho had ended, he was nothing like the actor in the film. Tout d'abord, il faut que les responsables First of all, those who are responsible for UN aggression should be punished. I was at the hospital this morning and I observed the people who had been buried there. Do you want the United Nations to withdraw from Katanga? Certainly. You insist on that? Yes. I want a private meeting with Jean Bay. Somewhere neutral. Just the two of us. While O'Brien did ask for a meeting with Jean Bay at the British consulate in Elizabethville, he only did so to buy time while he negotiated with UN headquarters to take over the consulate and arrest Jean Bay. When O'Brien's representative arrived for the negotiations, the guards opened fire on the car. After that point, there were no negotiations until Hammershold agreed to meet Jean Bay in North Rhodesia. This shot does an even better job of showing how bad the location is to represent Jadaville. There are no other buildings in sight, there's only light vegetation surrounding the compound, and there's a whole lake where there should be a golf course. We see this man in the white suit over and over again in the first half of the film, though there was simply no such man present. Like has been said elsewhere, this man most likely simply represents the mining companies. Again, we see an attack on a scale that simply didn't happen during the siege. Enough has been said of this scene. See this video by Forgotten Weapons. Safe to say, it never happened. While negotiations did take place, until the end of the battle, they all took place over the phone in the Pafina garage with the mayor of Jadaville. We would like a ceasefire to send in ambulances and uh, remove the dead and wounded. Tell your men we have a ceasefire. While a ceasefire was accepted, Quinlan refused the Katangi's request to send in ambulances that close to their positions in order to pick up their wounded, because he feared he would be tricked. There is no evidence of Katangi's forces using ambulances to close on the Irish positions, none of the Irish troops have ever stated it happened, and the only source for it is from a civilian who gave A Company wildly inaccurate information throughout the whole battle. Boss! Boss! It's a trap!
Despite the film acting like the mortars being deployed against them were a complete surprise, A Company had been under regular attacks since the beginning of the battle. The destruction of the Katangi's mortars occurred during the night bombardment which is shown during the film, so it's strange that they included it here and then decided to change the time it occurred. After this attack, we start seeing mercenaries using Soviet Dushka machine guns, despite the fact there's no way that one could have ended up in Katanga. The first evidence of a Dushka being used in the Congo isn't until 1964. How many dead at Radio Katanga? 30, sir. This will negate a vast reserve of goodwill towards the organization. The film reminds you of Radio Katanga over and over again, which is odd. It's like the film wants to remind you that O'Brien messed up, but doesn't want to go as far as to make the UN look bad, which would certainly be the case if they made reference to the many massacres and actions bordering on criminal the UN carried out in Elizabethville throughout Operation Morphor. We are a new thing. Sometimes new things stumble, but we pick ourselves up instead of pretending that we didn't fall. So we're going to say that in our first military intervention, we got it all wrong. Bizarre statement, considering the UN had been in the Congo for over a year at the time of the film, and had carried out a number of successful operations, while also having stumbled a few times, one of which famously involved Irish peacekeepers. It's our plan, our forces. How do we distance ourselves? By applying blame. Implying that Hammerschold intended to blame O'Brien for Morphor is simply misrepresenting the situation. To this day, there is debate over how much Hammerschold knew about Operation Morphor, it was almost certainly O'Brien's plan to solve the Congo crisis that backfired spectacularly. Dr. O'Brien. General Sobe. This meeting never happened. Would you rather my predecessor was still in charge? Shambi referring to Lumumba as his predecessor is nonsense, considering he wasn't, and Shambi seceded in order to get away from him. Do you think we did not hear the rumours about the Radio Katanga massacre? Again, with Radio Katanga, there were no rumours. The world knew about the massacre there and the one at the Elizabethville post office, practically immediately after they occurred. In fact, a journalist was on the phone with a wireless operator at the post office as the building was stormed. This paragon of virtue and fairness executed my loyalists. And Shambay is once again referred to as general, and he talks about the death of loyalists as though he's a warlord running a gang. Forget about your fellow Irishmen left out in the field. What do you mean? Because I didn't. I didn't forget about them at all. Unfortunately for the film, Jadaville really was a sideshow to what was occurring in Elizabethville. While Sean Bay almost certainly was aware of the battle underway, it wasn't the centre of some scheme. My boys are given everything they've got, but there's just not enough of us. I give you my word you'll have reinforcements with you tomorrow. We'll hold off until our last bullet's spent. The film finally acknowledges the existence of Force Kane, but in a way that makes it look like the Irish are still being abandoned. In reality, Quinlan himself asked Force Kane to postpone its attack across the Lafura Bridge until the next morning, because he was attempting to negotiate a ceasefire with the mayor of Jadaville. There is no mention of A Company's ammo dump being blown up anywhere in any sources. Sir, call Shomba directly. Tell him that the Secretary General of the United Nations is flying down to meet with him in the Congo. By the time the UN agreed to ceasefire talks, Hammerschold was in Leopoldville, capital of the Congo, and Shombe was running his government from a town on the border with North Rhodesia. Hammerschold agreed to meet him at Endola, just across the border. The poison the water. Take whatever we can from the barrels. So we have left out now. The Katangis never poisoned Jadaville's water supply. They did, however, turn off the supply to the street where the Irish were positioned, leaving it to go stagnant. A strange omission, given how diligent the film is in showing Quinlan's leadership, but he ordered the stockpiling of water around the same time as the first assault, knowing that at some point their water would almost certainly be turned off. Kane's platoon are at the bridge. Thirty men. What happened to the battalion? The film does the members of Force Kane a disservice by describing them as a platoon. In reality, it was over a hundred men that tried to get through to A Company. It was made up of A, B and the support platoon of the 35th Battalion, an armoured car section, a section of APCs from the Swedish contingent, and a medical team. Significant resources went into assisting A Company, 
considering conditions in Elizabethville. Again, the film makes it appear as though they were simply abandoned by command, when in reality, Force Kane found the bridge completely blocked by construction equipment, and had to attempt to clear it, while under fire from a company of Katangis dug in focused on the bridge. For four hours they tried to clear the bridge under continuous mortar and machine gun fire, before running out of ammunition and being forced to withdraw. A Company was already aware of the jet circling before it attacked, and had made preparations for an air attack. The bombing also damaged all of A Company's vehicles. Quinlan was never shot, I have no guess as to why he put this in the film. In reality, a soldier called Manning was shot in the shoulder by a sniper late in the battle. This entire scene is offensively bad. In short, ignoring the fact this conversation never happened, Hammershold left for North Rhodesia after the end of the battle. In fact, the surrender at Jadaville was one of the major factors that led him to being on the plane in the first place. O'Brien didn't resign until Hammershold's successor, Yu Fant, removed him from his post, and again, they mentioned Radio Katanga, and not the fact that O'Brien had gone over his head and had resulted in a complete mess. The implication here being that the US Air Force flew a brand new F-4 Phantom over the Congo to shoot down the Secretary General of the UN. It can't even be a case of budget restrictions, because if the shoot-down theory is to be believed, it almost certainly involved a Fauger Magister, like the one already shown in the film. This is arguably another spot in the film that suffers for not including the armoured car section. In reality, rather than flipping a jeep to create an anti-aircraft gun, it was the combined small arms and machine guns on two 1940s vintage armoured cars that damaged the jet. We're not abandoning them. If we engage in a battle for air superiority, it could lead to full-out war. In reality, the UN was in talks with the US Air Force to deploy jets to take down the Katangis Air Force, as Katanga was at that point practically in a state of full-out war. Quinlan's company was just a mistake on a chessboard, leaving a pawn vulnerable. This is probably the most accurate line in the entire film. Jellaville was a terrible mistake on O'Brien's part, Morphor was supposed to be over in a couple hours, and A Company should have never been in combat. UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld's plane went down. Again, Hammarskjöld didn't even leave for Indola until after the siege of Jadaville. There are no reports of survivors. There was also a single survivor of the crash, though he died almost a week later of his injuries. I am See what everybody does now. The movie continuously acts like Jadaville and the death of Hammarskjöld was some grand conspiracy between O'Brien, the Irish commander, Shombe, and the Americans, which is simply wrong. At no point was the helicopter going to be used to evacuate the wounded. At this point, there was reinforcements on the way, once again, to relieve A Company, and besides, the helicopter had been riddled with small arms fire and damaged by mortars after landing, leaving it unsafe to fly, which means this scene is simply ridiculous. Gene Schramm never teleported 4,000 miles with a weapon there's no record of the Katangis ever using to shoot down a helicopter that never flew in the Congo. After this point, we never see the two helicopter pilots again. I'm not sure if this means the film is implying they died, but in reality, they fought alongside the Irish until the surrender. Charlie Alpha Juliet to control. No response. Sir, the radio's working fine, they're just not answering. Try it again. I require an immediate decision on our last request. This is Charlie Alpha Juliet awaiting further instructions. This is Company A, J. Dodville Collin. I require immediate contact with anybody there. They can hear us, boss. There is no record of A Company being ignored by HQ and Elizabethville. In reality, they went on record as saying their radios were incredibly unreliable as they were both old and on the very limits of their range, meaning that atmospheric conditions often made communication impossible. They're gonna help us do what I've done if I know. The film entirely erases the existence of Force Kane 2, which, despite numbering 300 troops from the Irish and Indian contingents, faced even more difficulty than the first Force Kane. By the time Kane 2 reached the Lafura Bridge, all of the bridges in the area had been blown, and they came under air attack in addition to mortar and machine gun fire from hundreds of Katangis. Trying to break through to A Company, they lost three men killed and eight injured in the Indian contingent, and another wounded from the Irish contingent. After again being forced to withdraw, they suffered a further five wounded in the Irish contingent and five in the Indian contingent, and then in the confusion of the withdrawal from the ambush, two more Indian troops died and ten were wounded. These men are never mentioned once by the film.
A lot has been said about the thousands of Katangis that A Company supposedly faced off against during the siege. However, the only source for a number that high comes from the same civilian mentioned earlier, and if his numbers are to be believed, A Company was surrounded by something between 20 and 50% of the entire Katangis gendarmerie, which is in short impossible. The Katangis never actually got to be so close during the fighting as to be within the Irish positions. Grab the guns! There are no accounts from anybody involved in the battle that suggest they scavenged guns from dead Katangis. While not inconceivable that this happened, any long-time viewer of this channel could probably guess where the director got the idea of a mercenary dressed like this firing a 30 cal like that came from. While there was some house-to-house -house fighting in Jadaville during the battle, it took place at much longer ranges, and with the location they had in the film, would be impossible to depict. There was never an attack this large or carried out in this manner throughout the entire siege. While these ceasefire negotiations did take place in no man's land, they were carried out by Quinlan, the company chaplain, and their Swedish liaison and interpreter who was never shown in the film. They met with the mayor of Jadaville, the officer in charge of the gendarmerie in Jadaville who was black, and his white mercenary advisor. There was no shooting in the air by any mercenary, though the Irish did break the ceasefire once, though it's unsure if by accident or intentionally, by severing the leg of a white gendarme. In the film, the Irish surrender is shown as occurring immediately after the talks. In reality, it only occurred a few days later. Both sides used the time to size each other up for the final battle, with the Irish using the time to stall until the reinforcements could get through, and the Katangis using it to prepare positions surrounding the Irish. In the end, the Irish realised reinforcements would be unable to get to them, and they surrendered. As General Chombea continued to play games with the ON, we sat in jail under sentence of death. While A Company was treated harshly by their prison guards, they were not under sentence of death. By the time of their surrender, Shombe was actively trying to end fighting in Gatanga by negotiating with the UN. One of the deciding factors to negotiate was A Company's surrender. About a month later, word came that we were to be sent home. A Company remained in the Congo carrying out operations until December, when they returned to Ireland with the rest of the battalion. The C-130 wasn't used in the Congo, and it was still a relatively new aircraft. The Irish contingent was transported with Globemasters. It would simply have been easier to not include this shot. Commandant Quinlan, welcome back. It's a poor reception, I know. When the Irish were released from captivity, they were met at the airfield in Elizabethville with an honor guard, not just their commanding officer and O'Brien. I'm putting them all up for medals. It's not the right time. There's not going to be any mention of this. It's a complicated situation, and quite frankly, you've made it a lot more complicated. I don't want to get into the medal situation in this video, as it would require an essay in and of itself to do justice. It's safe to say there were a number of men at Jadaville who deserved awards for their actions. However, saying there will be no mention of Jadaville is simply not true. A Company returned to Ireland as heroes, and they initially received a lot of good press. What kind of a soldier are you? We can make it a lot worse. There's talk of a court-martial for cowardice. This is almost certainly false. There are no mention in any official documents of any court-martial. The line seems to be based off a comment by an Irish lieutenant that Quinlan would either come back from the Congo promoted or a corporal. This obviously never happened. I was right to do it. If I hadn't, the world would be a war now. I have no idea what this means. It makes no sense either in the film's context or in the historical context. While this line is correct, the omission of the men who were killed trying to rescue them is pretty disrespectful. This statement alone is worthy of another essay. A lot of the shunning faced by A Company didn't come from the top but from other rank and file members of the Irish military. A lot of it came down to individual units and could be attributed to the culture of Ireland at the time, and the culture within the military. It goes without saying that none of it was deserved, but like everything in this film, it's a half-truth that muddies the issue. This is another half-truth. Hamish old successor, Hugh Fant, removed O'Brien from his post and made sure he was far away as possible from any power within the UN. Only then did O'Brien resign. Roger Falquez, seemingly the name René, comes from journalists substituting his name for a more French-sounding one, never took part in any military coups. After Katanga, he was employed by the Kingdom of Yemen, and then by Afra, before retiring. And finally, while correct, the statement is a massive oversimplification, to the point of barely being true. Shombi became Prime Minister of the Congo after reunification, as part of a government of reconciliation. He was convicted for treason following his overthrow by Mobutu in 1965, and fled to Europe, where he was later kidnapped by French intelligence agents 
and died imprisoned in Algeria in 1969. And with that, the film is over. The Siege of Jadaville was an important film to get right. The Congo Crisis was one of the most important events in the history of the UN, the history of decolonization, mercenaryism, and the foreign politics of a significant chunk of Europe and almost all of Africa. Had Katanga gained independence, Africa today would have been a much different place, for better or worse, and there is a non-zero chance that the UN would have collapsed. When they left the Congo in 1964, the UN as an organisation was almost bankrupt. And that's exactly why the film is such a big disappointment. Despite the director's assertions that it's almost totally historically accurate, it makes mistake after mistake and lies outright about so many things. It has actively played a part in the distortion of history to the point where almost every article, essay, and video on the topic on YouTube uses imagery that was popularised by the film. Despite the claim that the film is responsible for the recognition of Irish bravery in the Congo, it erases the contribution of dozens if not hundreds of men who both served with A Company and tried to relieve A Company for days at the Lafira Bridge, and it completely erases the contributions of the Swedish, Norwegian, and especially the Indian contingent who suffered the most casualties. It's not an overstatement to suggest that the film gets a lot more wrong than it gets right, and while some things can be brushed off as the result of budget issues or time constraints, a lot more is simply ignorance. The director himself, in the same interview in which he calls the film realistic and well-researched, says that the Alamo, and especially Zulu, were a huge influence on him. I think in the future, it would be interesting to see a realistic version of Operation Morpho, or maybe even another take on the Siege of Janaville. It'd probably work much better as a miniseries, but I feel like if this film had, had just an extra 30 minutes in a better location, it would have done a much better job at representing what happened. All in all, it's a well-made action movie, but completely worthless as a piece of historical filmmaking. I would even go as far as to argue that if this is the only piece of work related to the Congo that someone encounters, they're actually worse off than if they didn't know about it at all. And on that note, that's all I really have to say about the Siege of Jadaville. Thank you for watching, apologies for the long absence. I'm getting back into the swing of making videos and should have some more ready to go in the near future. Keep an eye out for that. That's all for now.